If you want to have anything repaired in today's society, you're typically going to run into one of the following roadblocks. One, there are no replacement parts available. Two, there are parts available, but the price for those parts, or the labor involved, make the entire undertaking economically unreasonable. But let's say you are still willing to pay whatever it takes. Chances are that, three, there is actually no one who actually offers to do the repair. Because that business model has simply not been really a thing for years or even decades at this point. And four, and this is the worst part, after that environment has persisted for long enough, there simply aren't any people around anymore who actually even have the skills to do the job. Or that person or business is so rare that you just don't know where to find them. What would be required, of course, is an understanding of devices, machines and vehicles on a component level that would enable you to actually troubleshoot a problem. However, that kind of understanding is and has been for a long time a vanishing art. And there are good people who try to fight for governments to change the rules of the game through regulations so that the economic environment will change in such a way that over time repairs become a part of daily business once again. However, in the here and now and in your own life, there will often be only one person that will help you, yourself. So let me encourage you to be seemingly unreasonable and spend unreasonable amounts of time to be the change you want to see. And even if you don't see yourself as an idealist, sooner or later it might even actually save you a lot of money. And we will witness some of this in this very video. But first of all, let's have a look at some of the parts I want to take home from this scrapyard today. These large aluminium domes here, which remind me of flying saucers from 1950s sci-fi movies, are something special indeed. I've never seen anything quite like it, but I have a great idea what to do with those. And I found three of them and will take them to my workshop. One of the scrapyards also has some really cool gigantic stuff in store again. But unfortunately I don't own the workshop and property I work on. I pay monthly rent and that is why everything that takes up massive amounts of space ends up costing me money every day for just sitting there. I really love watching channels that work on heavy construction equipment and envy those guys sometimes. But I personally can't do anything like that as long as I'm in my current situation in an expensive city and on rented property. So what is this? Uh, oh no, what a pity. Believe it or not, but someone dumped this old Zaba audio system here on the scrap. And this is not just any run-of-the-mill radio. It is, or rather was, before it was scrapped, a really thought-after expensive collector's item. I will not be able to restore it properly, but maybe we can at least get parts of it working again. And in addition to the other aluminium parts we picked up already, I also found this historic folding box here that I also brought home. Another rare and rather valuable find. In contrast to these passion projects, we will also have to face a make it or break it repair job in this episode. My daily driver that I had only bought a year ago for a bunch of money broke down on me and it was a nerve wracking endeavor to get it back running. I'll tell you all about it in a few minutes, but first let's get back to the workshop. So I was able to obtain three of these peculiar things here. But what are they exactly and what will we use them for? This is a school building from the 1960s or 70s and it's about to be torn down. On its roof you can see those two dome or mushroom shaped caps and you can often find those on factory roofs and public buildings of all kinds. The ones we have here are also from the early 1970s but they happen to have a much more space age themed look to them and that's why I brought them home. They will make fantastic one-of-a-kind UFO style lamps. And since this project is all about the looks, we started by cleaning these parts inside and out using various methods. Wearing gloves and a mask is recommended since you don't know what might have been in those exhaust fumes. Maybe it was just air, but who's to say? The rough side of an ordinary kitchen sponge can be enough to clean old aluminium parts. If you push too hard, you may scratch the surface, but I feel like we have found good middle ground here. I want these lamps to look antique, but still bring back some of the shine they would have had in the past. To get all three of them in this condition is several hours of work, but believe me, it'll pay off. 
In the meantime, I have also decided what type of light source I want to install and also how many of them. We have three shades in two different sizes. While two of them are somewhat oversized, the third one is ridiculously large. I decided to install four globe-shaped bulbs in the two smaller lamps and in order to fasten those bulbs I'm bending pieces of aluminium stock into a V-shape and I also drill a few holes. Those are needed to fit two of these parts together and also to bolt them to the shades. Four old-timey ceramic sockets are screwed to the ends of these V-shaped parts. And for the third and biggest lamp I have essentially done the same thing only that the V-shaped parts are much larger and hold six instead of four bulbs. The shades consist of two parts and what you see here is the upper section that will hold all the essential components. And here you can have a look at the biggest of the three lamps in almost finished state. I decided to use LED bulbs with 125 millimeter diameter because everything else would look ridiculously small in here. These types of LED lamps are sold as Edison style LED bulbs because they mimic the old-timey look of early light bulbs while consuming only very little power. These are 6 8 watt bulbs, so we're talking 48 watts for all six of them. Next, I needed to find a good place to test and present the lamps, and I figured that the cherry tree in front of the workshop would be a great place for this. Now, I made them to be installed inside, but my ceiling might not be high enough to make this not completely ridiculous. And we've been thinking about hosting an open-air cinema night here in the garden, as we have done many times in the past. And this could add exactly the right touch to the cocktail bar that we usually improvise here under the cherry tree. I used chains to hang the lamps from uh, some of the branches, and these same chains could be used for an eventual permanent installation inside a building. Let's have a closer look at this historic item then. And it's not an ordinary box. This is a folding box made by the German company Zages. In the 1950s, half a million or so of these boxes were ordered by the German railroad service. The idea was that these boxes would be used to transport cargo from A to B, but would then be folded together on their way back so that they would take up much less space on the cargo train after they had been emptied. Then, of course, for the next job, they would be folded out again and new cargo would be inserted. Zages also manufactured boxes like these for the German army. The German word for weight of, say, 14 kilograms is Gewicht, while this box says Wicht, which is the Swedish word for weight. That's why I suspect that this box was indeed made for the Swedish armed forces then. How it found its way back to the country where it was made, hard to say. And as usual, it's extremely dirty, but nothing that can't be solved with a sponge and some degreaser. Unfortunately, a few parts are broken, and this seems to be a typical fold for these boxes. Both on the left and right hand side, the two outermost hinges connecting to the box's bottom or broken and need to be repaired or replaced. In order to do that, I start by using a punch and a hammer to drive this aluminum rod out of those broken hinges. I only push it as far as is absolutely necessary though. If you would remove it completely, it would be a huge pain to get back inside. With the broken pieces taken out, we still need to make space to install a replacement. And for that, I need to remove two of the old rivets, both on the left and right hand side of the box. I do that by first punch marking the center of the rivet before I use a drill to remove the rivet's head. 
After that, I use another punch to drive the remnants of the old aluminum rivet out. In the next step, I also remove this piece of aluminum here that the broken hinges were once part of. And in order to improvise some replacement parts, I simply cut out a rectangular piece from this aluminum sheet that I had left over from another project. And I use some pliers to bend one end into a round shape that roughly resembles the original hinge. I need to make four of these parts in total. In the next step, the aluminum rod was pushed back into its original position and the hinges were then riveted in place. The style of rivet that I have here is not as rugged as the rivets that were used originally and that is why I eventually decided to add two more rivets for each hinge. After doing this I had to punch the rod out again, but this time in the other direction so I could insert the replacement hinges on the right side as well. They were then fastened with rivets, of course. The replacement parts stand out by being all new and shiny, but time will take care of that eventually. Let's have a closer look at this poor thing then. Now if this were just an ordinary radio receiver, I wouldn't have taken it home in this condition. But this Saba Telecommander Freiburg is arguably one of the most complicated home electronics devices an ordinary person could have purchased in the mid-1970s. It integrates a quite powerful audio amplifier with an AM and FM receiver. But what is really special is that it had a remote control an ultrasonic remote control that is. The receiver of the remote control circuit would have turned the device on and off via a motor that actually cranks at a switch, as well as four additional motors that turn four pods for volume balance high and low. As you can see, it really is a basket case though. The wooden enclosure is completely destroyed. The metal frame is bent and broken in places. The device also has water damage and even some PCBs are cracked. You can be certain that all that only happened at the scrapyard though. Before that happened, this device would still have been worth around 300 bucks or so. It also has some electrical faults, but I can't troubleshoot them with PCBs that are literally broken. So here was my plan that I had when I found it. Take it completely apart, separate the audio amplifier and remote control circuits from the radio receivers and then build a new wooden enclosure and rebuild it as an audio amplifier with a fancy remote control feature. And this is actually what I did. Well, at least for the most part. I even fixed the physically broken voltage regulator circuit board. And then I also removed about 100 wires from the device to simplify its layout. This was only possible because I wasn't planning on reusing the actual radio receivers. The ultrasonic remote control circuit works with a microphone and resonance circuits. The remote control simply emits ultrasound at different frequencies, depending on the button you push, which are then picked up by the microphone and then you have different resonance circuits tuned to those frequencies. Once the right frequency for, say, volume up is picked up, that particular circuit resonates and fires the gate of a thyristor, which then drives the motor of the volume pot into one direction. However, I wasn't able to find a functioning remote control so far. I could probably build one myself, but this is really just a passion project. After many hours of rebuilding this, I was however able to get the amplifier running again. I had to stop working on this project for now though, since a pretty big problem came up that was much more urgent to take care of. So it was just an average day and I had parked my car on the backyard parking lot of a local grocery store to fetch a few things and when I returned from that store 10 minutes later, all of a sudden the car wouldn't start anymore. Right away, I called my buddy who I had bought this car from about a year ago. He repairs Subaru Foresters of the early 2000s all the time. So he asked me a few obvious questions. Does the starter work? Yes. 
do the fuel pump and ignition work? No idea. So after that phone call I walked to my workshop and fortunately that was only a 10 minute walk or so and I brought some equipment to the grocery store parking lot. So there are simpler ways to test if there is a spark if you have another person with you. But I saw no other option but to film the DMM with a high voltage probe while I'm sitting in the car turning the ignition. Apparently there was no spark though. So I had a closer look at all the fuses. There are some of them on the left of the steering wheel, others are under the hood like these ones. And it didn't take me long to find that this rather essential looking 30 amp JK's fuse was blown. Those fuses are certainly not the most typical ones in Germany and they are also rather expensive as far as car fuses go. As I have told you many times in the past, chances are that there is a good reason for a fuse blowing, especially if it's one that is rated at such a high current. You usually can't fix the problem by just replacing the fuse. But my hope was that I might be able to drive the car a few hundred meters to my workshop and then be able to troubleshoot the problem there properly. After walking to the shop, I had taken this e-bike with me on my way back here. Since it was a Saturday afternoon, I only had half an hour or so left to drive to a car parts store that would even have this type of fuse. So I was on my way and as luck would have it, the store had these types of fuses. However, if the problem should persist, I will have to find another way than to buy a ton of these super expensive fuses to troubleshoot the problem. So I have returned to the parking lot now and I insert the new fuse. And it's blown again. So in the next step I cobble together this adapter in the workshop that will allow me to use much cheaper 30 amp fuses of which I have a ton lying around anyway. Once the issue is found a proper J-case fuse will be installed of course. And since we already established that the starter works I was thinking about the next two obvious electrical loads that you need to start the engine that might cause the issue. However after disconnecting the ignition coil module from the car the short circuit persisted. In order to access the fuel pump I had to get in the back of the car and you have to remove this cover here. The connections to the fuel pump are underneath. And again after disconnecting the fuel pump the short circuit was still there. It looked like it must be something less obvious that will require a more methodical approach to troubleshooting the issue. But for that I wanted to have the car in my garden in front of the workshop so I could use proper tools and just as important, proper lighting. It actually took a few days, but eventually a friend came and we towed the car to my workshop. The next step was to find and download the 3000 plus page manual of the car and find out what connects to this particular fuse. As it turns out, this fuse is called SBF5. And in one of the car's wiring diagrams, we can see that SBF5 is connected to the battery's plus pole directly and then leads to a cluster of a whole number of components summarized under MB9. And on another page of the manual we find a list of the contents of MB9. Data link connector, engine control module, fuel pump relay, ignition relay, immobilizer control module. While that is good to know, this is actually terrible news. One, these are at least three independent vital systems that the car can't work without, all connecting to the same fuse. Two, even though only one of them has it in the name, at least four of these can actually immobilize the car, which is what we have here. And three, with the engine control module without power, we can't use onboard diagnostics. In the next step, I tried to locate the fuel pump and ignition relays as listed under MB9, which I found extremely hard to do. The car has a million relays and nowhere in the manual did I find an easy to read overview of the location of these relays. In the end I tested all kinds of relays that I found but none of them had a short circuit. So I proceeded to look for the engine control module. In the Subaru Forester SG the ECM is located behind a steel cover in front of the passenger seat. I then looked up the pinout of the zillion connectors leading to the ECM but found out that the different connectors are not necessarily neatly separated between different systems of the car. 
it looked very confusing. So I decided to simply find out if I could narrow down the fold by trying to remove one of the connectors at a time with all others connected, trying to start the car every time, then checking if the fuse would blow or not. Using this method, I learned two things. A, you don't actually have to even try to start the car to blow the fuse. It happens before you even actually turn the ignition to the point where the starter engages. The fuse blows after turning the key to position three, cutting the power from the rail that supplies the ignition and fuel pump before you can even try to start the engine. And B, if I disconnect this connector here, the fuse no longer blows. I still can't start the car, but this was an important piece of information. And C, I ordered a replacement ECM that I had found for 30 euros and connected it instead with the same result though. The ECM is not the problem. So let's summarize. Basically everything that is listed as being connected to this fuse seems to work and not cause a short circuit. Still the fuse blows. Mysterious. Again, using the manual, I was able to find out that that one blue connector on the ECM leads to this big brown connector here in the engine compartment. It connects to connector E2, which leads to the engine wiring harness. If you unplug this connector instead of the one on the engine control module, the short circuit also no longer occurs. I was getting tired of burning through so many fuses and at this point I had found out that it's really a dead short that I could detect by simply measuring the voltage drop over a 50k ohm resistor that I had inserted instead of a fuse. It wouldn't be enough to power up anything of course, but this way I was able to see if the dead short persisted without causing any further damage. Using this method and also blowing a fuse now and then to double check whenever I felt like I found something unusual, I was able to determine that the short circuit was indeed happening via this ground point here connecting to one of the intake manifolds. Now this doesn't mean much since there is a lot of stuff going on here, but it's a good sign that the issue must be somewhere in or around the engine wiring harness. After realizing that, I unplugged every component that I could find that is actually connected to the harness step by step, checking for the short circuit every step of the way. But the short circuit persisted even after all components I could find were disconnected. I still wasn't really sure if I had really found all the parts connecting to the harness. Many of them were hidden and very hard to access. I also couldn't really see what I was doing half the time because it was really dark outside. Of course, I had also noticed that there are lots of hollowed out cherry stones all around the engine from the big cherry tree in my garden. And this worries me because rodents must have been in here. But more about that in just a minute. At this time, I was getting really desperate because I was pretty sure that I had disconnected all the parts connecting to the harness and there still was a short circuit. And then this happened. I can't freaking believe this, man. I just removed the windshield wiper fluid reservoir with the pumps on it and I can't start the engine again. Fuse doesn't blow, can you believe it? In fact, I checked the three pumps connecting to the reservoir and found out that there is a dead short across the big black one that is used to spray the headlights. Arguably the most non-essential electric system of this vehicle. So I was actually really excited and I drove the car for a few hours and I parked it on a public parking lot close to my apartment. However, I felt uneasy all the time, mostly because of one reason. The windshield wiper pumps are not connected to the 30 amp fuse in question. So when I returned to the parked car a few hours later, we were back to square one and the car had the same issue as before. It was once again sitting there on a public parking lot and wouldn't start. At this point I was suspecting that the wiring harness itself was damaged, possibly due to rodent bite, and I tried to get a replacement harness but simply wasn't able to find an exact replacement online. For a 20 year old model that is very rare in this country in the first place, this can be a really hard thing to do, especially if you need the part ASAP and don't want to spend like 300 bucks for it. So I begrudgingly looked up a specialized Subaru repair shop 35 kilometers away and had the car towed there. 
in the hope that the guys there would find the problem and solve it. And then two weeks went by and I heard nothing yet. So I called them and they told me that the car was running again and was ready to be picked up. However, they didn't do a systematic search of the fault, but rather just unplugged all the connectors, like I had done before twice actually, and cleaned the contacts and plugged them back in. Seemingly, that was enough to get the car running again on the first day. And this basically meant that they were unable to do any further troubleshooting, because, well, everything was simply working. Now you can imagine that I was shocked to hear that they had not really replaced anything and hadn't identified the cause of the issue. So I picked it up and drove the car back home. To the 150 bucks for towing, add another almost 600 bucks for the workshop. To be completely fair though, that price included an oil change and a minor mechanical repair that I had told them to take care of as well. Nonetheless, including the useless replacement ECM and all the blown fuses, I was about 800 bucks in the hole already. And then the next morning, when I wanted to start the car, you guessed it, I was back to square one, fuse SPF 5 blown, car wouldn't start. So out of desperation, I decided to call my buddy again. And after describing everything that had happened, a new idea came up during the phone call. In all his years repairing these cars, he had never had this problem. But I still learned a key piece of information. He told me that it would be possible to replace the entire engine intake manifold module including the engine wiring harness and almost all parts it connects to. And as luck would have it, he had this exact part in store and he was even willing to send it to me for free. And long story short, the package has arrived and this is our last chance to save a car that I've only been driving for a year and that had cost me a bunch of money. So the following repair job actually took me an entire afternoon because I tried to be extra careful here, but I'll try to make it quick. At first I visually compared the replacement assembly to the original part to make sure everything would indeed fit. Then I took a lot of pictures of every detail so I could check later if there was anything that I might have forgotten. After disconnecting the battery, I unplugged the ignition wires and actually completely detached them from the old manifold. The air filter assembly was removed and the connectors close to it were unplugged. I documented every step and every connector or bolt removed with a picture. This way I later only need to follow my own pictures in reverse when installing the replacement part. This way you can make sure not to forget anything along the way. I then detached the throttle cable and also a bunch of hoses. I needed to apply hot air to actually get them off. And then there were lots of smaller connectors all around that I needed to unplug. One connector buried down deep here, I can't really reach it. It's under the alternator and since I have a replacement alternator anyway, uh, let's just take this one out then and replace it as well. After removing the alternator, I also detached the steel parts that cover the injectors. I did this to be able to pull the manifold assembly out from between different hoses. This wouldn't have been necessary if I had just removed the water pump and that would have made things a lot easier here. And after unscrewing a number of M8 bolts that were holding the manifold assembly down, I was eventually able to remove it altogether. And upon turning it upside down, I was able to inspect the hidden parts of the engine harness for the first time. And I could tell right away that it was in a really bad shape. More about that in just a minute though. After pulling the old module, I stuffed the air intake so nothing would fall in. I still have to remove the old gaskets and didn't want any of the cherry stones to fall in there. As you can see, some rodent must have spent a lot of time in here and I have to prevent this from happening again at all costs. So I cleaned up the top of the engine here, vacuumed all the cherry stones off and cleaned the gasket seats on, well, both surfaces actually, before putting a new set of gaskets in place. The new manifold assembly was then installed and everything I just showed you happened in reverse, of course, including the installation of a replacement alternator. And now it was time for the moment of truth.
Now, this was actually four weeks ago and the car has been running without any issues since. But of course, I would never be able to trust the car again if I wouldn't be able to find the cause of the problems I had. So let's inspect the parts we just removed from the car. In order to do that, I detached the wiring harness completely and started to inspect it closely. And it wasn't hard at all to find the fault. Can you see the charred hole here? This is unfortunately just that part of the harness that lies directly under the manifold and that can't be inspected without removing this entire assembly from the engine. And in order to see more, I started to peel away the brittle and broken outer mantle of the harness. The insulation of this rather thick yellow wire is completely missing for several centimeters and many of the fine copper wires are chewed off, everything around it is charred. This is clearly the cause of our problem. It also explains the intermittent and unpredictable nature of the short circuit. Pieces of this bare copper wire must have been in contact to chassis ground sometimes and then maybe they just shook themselves loose again, allowing the car to run for a while until, well, it randomly made contact with some aluminium surface or another wire again. So this would also explain why disconnecting parts did not help at all. The problem was in the harness. I believe that this damage was caused by rodents that chewed off the insulation. The brittleness of the wiring harness might also have been caused by the rodent's urine. Come autumn, I will no longer park my car here and I should probably also install a rodent repeller of some kind. In case you have any good ideas of how to repel mice and other critters, please leave a comment below. This entire endeavor spent over two months, by the way, in which I drove my mother's car when I needed a ride. It has also shown that a tiny electrical fault can make a good car almost worthless from one day to the other. I also felt a little arrogant when I thought that most car repair shops are not to be trusted with electrical troubleshooting. But, well, unfortunately those suspicions might not have been completely unfounded. And even though I wish I could have avoided this entire situation, I certainly learned a lot about my car here. Unfortunately, I also feel affirmed once again that the system we live in is not built to keep any given machine running as long as possible. I do not blame the guys in the workshop though. Don't hate the player, hate the game. Car mechanics in many workshops cannot afford to spend the time that would actually be necessary to troubleshoot unpredictable faults like this one. The alternative way of simply replacing everything that might be at fault with brand new parts would have cost a huge repair bill. But installing a brand new fuel pump, ignition coil, alternator and starter for example still would not have fixed this issue. It is a dilemma and under other circumstances a broken piece of wire could have meant that this project would have ended where most of my projects actually begin, at the scrapyard. So this is what I had in store for you today and in case you liked this video please give it a like, it would really mean a lot to me. And in case you want to support future videos, please consider making a donation. A link for that is under the video. Or you can become a supporter on Patreon under patreon.com slash tpai. See you soon.